Hello, and welcome to The Art of Aging, which is part of the Abundant Aging podcast series for United Church Homes. On this show, we look at what it means to age in America and in other places around the world with positive and empowering conversations that challenge, encourage, and inspire all to age with abundance. As part of our Aging and Innovation series, I am very pleased that we have Heather Nickerson, co-founder and CEO of Artifacts, for the interview today. Uh, And Artifacts is all about cherishing our favorite things while helping them move on as we move on in life. And today we're going to talk about Swedish death cleaning, which is a really cheerful term and but that's that's the subject, and, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So, Heather, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm thrilled to join you this afternoon. Looking forward to talking about Swedish death cleaning, which is definitely a mouthful. But I want to assure all of our listeners, it is not as dreary as it sounds. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah, you, you realize the word death is in the name, right? <laughs> we do. The Swedes, though, call it dostatning or literally the art of death cleaning. And it's a Swedish practice by which the elderly- That doesn't make it any better. You know know that, in my, okay. It's even more of a tongue twister. Yes. I did live in, in full disclosure, I lived in Denmark for a year in college. So all those crazy Scandinavian words, I love them. I recognize that everyone does, but dostetning, it is the Swedish term that means essentially putting your affairs in order as you age. It lets families go through their stuff and their loved ones do it together. Because when you think about it and you get to end the life, typically you have hundreds, if not thousands of items. And who wants the burden to be on the next generation? So the Swedes, being very clever that they are, they develop this practice where you you work with your loved ones over time to go through all their things, from the family heirlooms to the really just simple mundane objects. And you have a conversation. What do you want to happen with this item at the end? The term itself became very popular in 2018. There is a Swedish author called Margareta Magnusson, and she wrote a book that was eventually translated into English called The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. And I do want to share one specific quote from Magnusson, because I think that just sums up the entire, what is this and why do we do this so well? Magnusson states in one of the opening chapters that whether it's sorting the family heirlooms from just junk, downsizing to a smaller place, or setting up a system to help you stop misplacing your keys, death cleaning gives us the chance to make the later years of our lives as comfortable and stress-free as possible. And I think those are really the two key terms we want to think about today in our conversation, as comfortable and as stress-free as possible. And that's where I think the joy comes into this. You can experience that with your loved ones, pass on the stories and the stuff, and not be burdened by it. There is so much there, I got to I got to say. So, I mean, you know, my mind went to the Marie Kondo aesthetic, you know, that was sort of popular a couple of years ago of a very minimalist, you know, does this this object give you joy, things like that. And and as a collector of anything Scandinavian and, and, and Danish in this house, believe me, it all gives me joy. So I, I, I just think it's it's, it's tough for me to, to, to do that editing, at least with Marie Kondo's lens. But <laughs> I like the part about, you know, making it easier to find your keys. It's all, it's, it's not just about memorialization. This is about organization. And this is about maybe your relationship to your things, to your lifestyle at that moment, right? Because your your needs change, your interests change, your hobbies change, and your relationships with your, with your stuff changes, doesn't it? Yes, definitely over time. And I'm so glad you brought up Marie Kondo because her whole set premise is that if it doesn't bring you joy, don't keep it. Which if I were to try to do with my daughter, we would never be able to clean or organize her room because everything brings her joy. Where with Magnuson and Swedish chef cleaning, it's less about, does this bring you joy? If it does, that's great. That's fabulous. But it's more about what do you want to happen to this item when you're no longer here? Which friend or loved one do you want to have this? Why do you want them to have it? Like, why is it a cherished part of you? You've kept it for all these years. What do you want to happen to it next? Like kind of who's that next safe keeper of this item? Or if it's the mundane stuff, just like, hey, I have this. I bought it in a thrift store three years back. It currently brings me joy. I love it. I use it every day. But you don't need to keep it when I'm gone. You can you can donate it. You can sell it. Um, it's that it's that type of putting your stuff in order. God, I'm so interested. Well, and, and, and I can see why you know you're really interested in the subject, given your work with artifacts. I mean, can you tell us what artifacts is all about? Sure. So artifacts, we spell it A R T I F C T S. So there is no second A in artifacts. 
but that's artifacts.com or also our online app, Google Play or the App Store. But we let you capture, preserve, and share the history, the stories, the meaning, and also the value behind all your stuff. And why this is so important is that six years ago, my mother passed away completely out of the blue. And as the eldest and only girl, I essentially inherited 6,000 square feet of stuff. And my brothers were like, good luck with that. And it was, we, we could tell very quickly what the valuable items were, but we had a really hard time knowing what were the things that my mother cherished most? What would she have wanted us to keep in the family to tell her story for future generations? And also what would she have been like, yeah, that was fine. I liked it, but go ahead and sell it or go ahead and donate it. Or we just, we didn't know. And objects, they cannot talk just like photos. They cannot tell you their story and their history. In this case, only my mother could have told us those stories, those histories of her stuff, and she was no longer here. So for us, we created artifacts to ensure that anyone anywhere has the ability to safely and secure, securely pass down the stories and the history along with their stuff. That is so interesting because, you know, at least we're, we're speaking, on, you know, on behalf of United Church Homes. I mean, we we are independent living centers. We, we we deal with a lot of folks that are that are obviously doing these these sorts of transitions. And you know, when we think about you know having to manage a household and maybe needing a little bit more help and wanting to simplify and wanting to, you know, you're talking about essentially breaking up with things. You know, you're you're you're, you're leaving communities. You're making choices about you know, what to keep and what to bring and all of those things. So, so the exercise you're talking about is very relevant in that sense. And, you know, I think about, you know, if I have, if I can't take an old collector car that I have, maybe I can just take like the uh, gear shift knob yes. and, and take it with me and sort of have that. Because, you know, when I think about our stuff, we, th- we talk about, you know, not just the, how you, how it looks, but, you know, how it feels in your hand, you know, that, that, that sort of handshake you have with the things that you love, those, those objects that you love, right? So there's, mm-hmm. there's way to kind of compromise so that you're not losing the entire car. You're maybe memorializing the car online and keeping a small piece of it just to have that, that, that experience, right? Yes, that's so true. Because I think a lot of what ties us to our stuff is our emotional connection with it. Like we feel something when we look at a thing, it reminds us of a time, a place, a person. We have that emotion behind it, which is why sometimes it's so hard to let go of your stuff, which is where Swedish death cleaning, I think it's it's brilliant in that when you are choosing to let go or pass on or rehome an item, you're also giving the story with that item. So you're saying, dear daughter, I want you to have this item and here are all the reasons why. This is why it matters to me. This is what it makes me think of. This is what it makes me feel. You're sharing those memories, those emotions with the person that you're essentially rehoming or gifting the item to. So it's not a sad goodbye. You're not tossing it in a garbage bin or a recycling bin or putting it out on the side of the street for free or having a yard sale and watching your possessions, you know, walk off with no future contact. With the art of Swedish death cleaning, you're really able to ensure that that story, the history, the memory goes along with the actual object. And you're making a very conscious choice as you go through it that you're choosing who is going to love this item as much as you, or who's going to cherish it, or who's going to be really intrigued by it, or even just who's going to keep it in the family. Sometimes it's who's got the largest house that can keep this for the next generation. That can also be a consideration. So it doesn't always have to be strictly sentimental. It can also be very functional and practical, but that's really, that's the, I think that's where the joy comes in is that you, you're able to do this to, again, simplify your life de-stress when it comes to stuff. And to your point, with you're talking about independent living, enabling you to, there's there's no way 4,000 square feet of stuff is going to fit into say a 1,200 square foot, you know, apartment. So it enables you to make those decisions involving your loved ones as you go through the process. And it's not, you know, it, you know we're talking a lot about, about transition to senior living and things mm-hmm. and things like that. It's, 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 I still can't get past the, the, death, the death cleaning name. Sounds so, sounds so morbid. But, you know, if, I, if I'm going through this in my mind, what I was just thinking about was, you know, people have these, these intersections with objects throughout their lives, you know, and, and I can think about my son and, and how he had his favorite baby blanket. Yep. And then uh, we had his, maybe he got his first A plus on a test or things like that. And those are things that will naturally leave us or have left us. Mm-hmm. 
But when you think about when he thinks about it, like, you know, years later, la- years later, like, what did my old baby blanket look like, you mm-hmm. know, or, what, you know, then then a digital service like yours and others that, that can that can really sort of just support these these intersections and, 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 and just letting things go. Right. I mean, it's just a, I mean, there's a virtual closet out there and it never gets full. <laughs> it's a virtual closet you can always go back and look at and reminisce and share with others too. That's the beauty is that you're not just, it's not something sitting in a box, taking up space in your house. Um, you could, to your point, keep a piece of the item, like the baby blanket, keep a square and frame it or, or do, you know, there's many creative ways to utilize that type. I think of upcycling into something new from an old object. But I think the really one thing I do want to stress is we call it Swedish death cleaning, but you don't have to be on death's doorstep to do it. I promise you that. Even my 12 year old <laughs> laughs and I'm like, let's organize or clean your room. She's like, do you want to death clean it, mom? I mean, it's, she is in that flippant <laughs> stage. So she knows exactly what my response is going to be, <laughs> but it's very true. And in fact, a lot of folks we do, I do a lot of work with folks who are in the downsizing process. And that is where I think this is really helpful because you're in your sixties, you're in your seventies, you are vibrant, you are full of life. You are living a very abundant life, but you're having to make decisions or transitions. And that again is where this is a great time to stop and reflect and think about your stuff and think about what do you want to happen to it next. And that's really, again, where this, the entire art of this process is all about what happens to it next. You know, and that's the thing, because it's an interesting reflection on your life, where you are right now, where you've been. It's a moment that can enlist a lot of pride, I think, in the things that you might have accumulated. I think it's it's interesting to note the kind of, you know, uh, you know, this person might like this, like might like that. But it sort of uh, it does open the door for other things like people need advanced directives. People you know, are talking about, you know, where where, where I might want to uh, you know, donating money or, or, or other types of decisions. It's and, and back to the point where it's, it's not just a one and done. I mean, you can do this at, 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 at several points in your life. You know, because I think because you must hear this all the time. I mean, no one's going to want my stuff. No one's going to want my stuff, right? So this is a way of maybe validating that people may want, you know, answering that question, yes or no, right? Oh, they actually don't want my stuff. Great. I can donate it all or I can have a big estate sale or I can do this. But what, what do you say to people when they say that, that sort of thing to you? I will first say when I hear no one wants my stuff, I usually jump up and say, that is not true. Have you told them the stories behind your stuff? Have you shared the history? And I can say after a couple of years of doing this day in, day out, so many people are under the impression no one wants my stuff. The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Atlantic, every major publication has talked about how no one wants this item or that item, or no one wants your stuff or your grandparents' stuff. But when we talk with our actual members and we hear the stories of, well, once I I told my sons the stories behind the three brass trays that have been hanging in our home for decades, they each want one. Or, you know, it's it's that type of when you share the history and the story, it's amazing what happens. Even I've got a great example of my grandmother's China. She, you know, tried to give the China away to others in the family and no one wanted it. And I, I think I was like further down the pecking order of who got asked about the China. And since I love to entertain and cook, and I was like, sure, I would I would love the China grandma. And my thought was I may not use it every day, but I'll keep it in the family and keep the options open. And then everyone thought in the family it was a gift from her to her and to grandfather during their wedding. And I finally sat down with her. I was like, well, tell me the story about the China. If I'm going to keep it, I, I want to know the history and the story. And she told this amazing story about when they were stationed overseas in Liberia in 1957 and how the ambassador came to her and said, dear Martha, you have to start entertaining and you need to set a China for 12. And imagine trying to get a set of China into Liberia, Africa in the 1950s. It was not easy. So now knowing the story, it's, I mean, in my mind, such a cool story. And I'm definitely going to keep that China. And it was amazing. Once other, we then shared, we actually artifacted the China. We then shared it with broader family. And a bunch of folks were like, hey, how did you get grandmom's China? It's like, well, I think she asked all of you first. See, and that never happens. That never happens, right? I mean, yeah, the China is just such a, an obvious, you know, example, you know, especially if, you know, if they're, if they've got a silver rim and it can't be microwavable yep. or, you know, things like that. But boy, it, and, and, and that sort of, you know, that strikes me that, you know, the stuff that may be most valuable to people may not just have a lot of monetary value to it, right? I mean, yeah. it, it just may just be this odd, like a ticket stub or, or something like that. And that's what we've also seen too, is that first is that everyone says, no one wants my stuff. And we quickly debunk that myth. And it's when you share the story, you share the history, 
typically you have takers for your things. The other piece is that when you sit down and you start thinking about reflecting on your stuff, you're going through the Swedish death cleaning process, you're picking up an object, you're thinking about it, what do you want to happen to this? It's amazing that when you, when you look at how you're attached to items, it's often not the most valuable items that will cause you most angst of letting go. The, the jewelry, the artwork, the crystal, sometimes those are easier decisions. Sometimes it's a really, it's the tough decisions are what we call heart value. And it's that sentimental feeling or that it's attached to a really precious memory. It could be, you know, a letter that your mother sent you back when you were graduating college, or maybe it's a voicemail you've had in your phone for, you know, 15 years from your grandpa's. It's those items that you want to keep, you want to keep close to you. You're not willing or ready to let go of those items. And that's okay. When you're Swedish death cleaning, you don't have to get rid of everything. In fact, you're supposed to keep the items that are nearest and dearest to you and just ensure that your loved ones know what happens with them when you're no longer here. You know, and I never thought about voicemails as being momentous, but of course they are. Of course they are. And that's that's another opportunity for digital. Obviously, it's already digitalized, so you, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's mm -hmm. a, a cassette, you know, a tape from an old phone answering machine and things like that. All right. So... You've, you've sold me on the concept. Let's let's say we, we give it a go. I mean, I we have a, a lot of stuff here. We are collectors. So how, how does someone get started with Swedish stuff cleaning? So it's really simple to start. Oftentimes we hear the hardest part is picking what to start with first. So it's as easy as picking an object. It could be any object and pick it up, look at it, think about it. Like take a moment to pause and reflect on this object. It doesn't have to be long, but a minute, 30 seconds. Once you've thought about it and thought about what it means to you and any memories associated with it, then think about what do you want to happen next to this object? Do you want to keep it if you're downsizing or moving, or even if you're just staying in place and trying to get better organized, do you want to keep it? Do you want to rehome it? If you want to rehome it, who's going to get it? Is it a lucky family member, a friend? Do you want to donate it? Do you want to sell it? What do you want to happen next with this object? And that's really how the process works. You can go, you can take it box by block box. You can take it closet by closet. You can take it room by room. I wouldn't recommend doing, trying to do an entire house all at once because it will be exhausting, but you simply start with an object, pause and reflect for a moment, and then think about what do you want to happen to it next? Once you've done that, if you want to jot down a little, you know, a handwritten note is always great or a post-it, but just essentially jot down your intentions. And then finally reach out. If you're going to rehome the object, reach out to that loved one or friend and let them know like, dear brother, you're going to be the lucky inheritor of my, you know, whatever that object happens to be and, and let them know that. And then you can always, you know, whenever the timing is right for you, arrange a time to then exchange or to rehome the object. Same if you're donating, reach out to the charity and let them know you're donating this object. Or if you're selling it, contact either, you know, a state sale um, location near you, or if you're going to list it on an auction house or whatever that happens to be. But it enables you to kind of very logically work through, this is what this object is. This is what it means to me and why it matters, why I've kept it. This is what I want to happen to it. And then that final step is actually executing on the, what do you want to happen to it next phase? I've been, uh, you know, it's that whole thing. I got it. We, you know, we have collections of collections here and that's actually a question for you, but I've been looking at this. Um, this is a, a, a 1960s teak Danish pepper grinder. And I've been looking at this and thinking, oh, did I find this in this antique shop? Was I on a trip when I was doing it? That's really interesting to kind of bring that home. But then... You know, you've got single objects, but then you also have collections. That's what's going through my mind. You know, and collections are one where you know the 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 joy of me having a a single dance teak pepper grinder is great, but but having eight of them and they all look great as a collection on a table somewhere is another thing too. You know, so so you can we can think about things as a singular, but how, how do you think about things as a collection? That's the beauty of Swedish death cleaning. Is you don't have to be a minimalist to Swedish death clean. You can look at an entire collection and say, this entire collection of pepper shakers, I love. And I've got a great memory of buying them over in Denmark. And I was with my best friend or my sibling or my spouse or whoever that happens to be, whatever the story is. You can essentially choose to either keep or rehome the entire collection. Or if you don't, you know, we were talking earlier about, I think you had the example about keeping that, that the knob on the, the gear shift. 
if you don't have space to keep the entire collection, you can still document the story, document the memory behind the entire collection, but, but keep one piece of it. But that's really what I love about the Swedish death cleaning process as opposed to some of the other, um, I think, ways of cleaning and decluttering and downsizing that are more minimalist focused. Swedish death cleaning does not force you to be a minimalist. You're allowed to love your stuff. You're allowed to embrace your collections. We, you're encouraged to tell the story behind them and the history behind them and make decisions of what happens with them. But you're not forced to only choose one or, oh my gosh, you can't have any collections. They take up too much space. Not at all. <laughs> Very good. Well, we are going to get, I mean, this has been a terrific discussion. I'm definitely learning a lot about it. And it's actually very reassuring, you know, just to know how, 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 how warm the process can be and how accommodating the process can be. And I just wish it wasn't called Swedish death cleaning, but that's just me. You know, it could be Swedish what's next cleaning or something like that, but that's just me. But we do have a part in our podcast where we like to ask our guests three questions. And those questions are about aging because this is the art of aging. Um, but before we do that, is there any other tips or things that you could share, you know, for people that are looking to get engaged mm -hmm. with the Swedish death cleaning process? And importantly, where can we find artifacts? Sure. I would say on the Swedish death cleaning side, if you're going through the process, pick the object, think about it add the story, add the history. Yeah. I would also say, regardless of however you're choosing to do this process, if you can include a video or an audio file with the object, if you're choosing to give it to a loved one or friend, that is, I think that's the gift that keeps on giving. Like being able to hear, you know, your mother's voice tell you why this necklace mattered to her, or being able to hear your grandfather's voice telling you why you're getting the star from the Christmas tree. Like that, that is super duper special. So at Artifacts, you can do that all in one. And when you make the artifact, you have audio, video, photos, it's all there. But even if you don't use Artifacts, I think it's really important to think about kind of, we live in a digital world and I'm in a multimedia-based world. I think, you know, back in the day, it was just enough to have a little sheet of paper and write down, dear so-and-so, this is what it is, this is where it's going. But I think nowadays, especially the next generation, kids, grandkids, having that added video or audio is so heartwarming. So I would encourage all of you, if you're going to embark on this process, definitely consider digital and multimedia solutions as well. And then where you, again, where you can find us, it's artifacts.com, A-R-T-I-F-C-T-S.com. We're in the Google Play or Apple App Store. That's awesome. So, uh, yep, for listeners, artifacts, and that is spelled A-R-T-I-F-C-T-S. Perfect. All right, Heather, are you ready to get into our uh, three questions? Let's go. I love this part of the show. Okay. So this is the part of the show where we ask our guests three questions about their own perspectives on aging. And here's question number one. When you think about how you've aged, Heather, what do you think has changed about you or grown with you that you really like about yourself? So I would say, I think my patience has definitely grown over time. I think back to things now where I'm like, all right, like this is going to take a little bit longer than I thought. Back in my twenties, no, like I could not sit still. I was always on the go, always moving. And I think now, especially, you know, having a family and even having, especially a preteen in the house, my patience is tested every single day. And I, I do like the fact that I, I think I'm a much more patient person, um, which is probably good all around. And it, it comes in handy when running a business too. It's having to have patience that, you know, deadlines may slip or things may not happen on your timeline, but that's okay. That's terrific. And then question number two, what has surprised you the most about you as you've aged? I think probably the biggest surprise so far is that I don't really feel any older per se. Like I think in my mind, like, oh my gosh, like when I hit 40, I was going to feel older or I was going to feel more mature or it's going gonna, it's gonna to physically and mentally feel different. And I think for me, I sometimes actually still even forget like what age I am. And I've got a really funny story where I was at a, a border crossing overseas, traveling overseas, and they were confirming my, you know, how old I was with my passport. And I gave the wrong answer and I was off by two years. I just completely like for me, it's I guess I don't, you know, I don't think of myself as any older. I don't feel older. I still feel like me, which maybe is not the best way to describe it, but I don't know how else to describe it. So I thought I'd feel very differently by now. Yeah. And I think what we're trying to encourage people, to, I mean, I, that's, that's a terrific story. And I, I, I also think a, it's, it's, a, it's a through line, too, with other guests that we've had, you know, and talking about that, who, how, you, you know, the, the way that we or I reflect on it is like, you know, your body is going to get older, but what's special about you grows richer. 
over time. And that's what the added experiences and perspectives, but the, the things you hold deal, your personality, the things you like about it, all those things are just through lines, you know, ad infinitum, which I think is very, very hopeful. And then question number three, is there someone that you've met or been in your life that has set a good example for you in aging? Someone that inspires you to age abundantly? Yes, definitely. Back when I was an analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency, I had the most amazing- Wait, hold, that, 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 you were an analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency? <laughs> yes, I was. That was my first career. I like to think about myself as- And at our next podcast, Heather's going to spill the beans. On, no. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's great. It's the many sides of me. I had this mentor that was just so striking and amazing, and she had broken through the ranks. She had essentially broken through every glass ceiling there was imaginable at the agency, and she was so well respected and so just. She was a powerhouse, and to me, that was so inspirational. And how she approached aging and age. Like she truly, she'd always tell me age is just a number, but she, like, she showed me that every single day. Like, I have no doubt she to this day could probably kick my butt in any cardio exercise we ever would do. Um, and she was just, she didn't slow down. She just took life like, you know, one adventure after the next. And even when she retired, she didn't, I mean, I think she retired on a Friday and Monday she was already advising on a board. Like she was just, she was that, is that person and still is to this day a huge inspiration to me and really someone that I look to when I think about how do I want to age? I always tell my husband, like, I want to be just like her. Like that is my goal. So <laughs> that's absolutely true. I'm so happy that you've had someone like that in your life. It's just what a, what a great inspiration. Well, Heather, this has been a terrific podcast. I've learned so much, even if I'm poking fun at the name all the time. Sorry about that. But I just really, really value your time and and, and, and sharing with our listeners these tips, just our relationships with our things. You know, wow, it's it's it can go really, really deep. And thank you for, for giving us some pathways to, you know, to deal with them as our own bodies and relationships and all that change. So, and oh, by the way, thank you to the listeners for listening to this episode of The Art of Aging, which is part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. And we do want to hear from you. What do you think about Swedish death cleaning? What do you think about what Heather shared today? Who's your aging hero? What's changed about you that you that you really like about yourself as you as you age? T tell us about this at the Abundant Aging Podcast dot com. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube under United Church Homes. And also check out uh, the Ruth Frost Parker Center, which is the thought leadership side of United Church Homes. We're doing an Oct October symposium every year in 2023 this year. We're doing one on combating ageism that we're really excited about. So please check that out. And once again, Heather, where can people find you? Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you to all of our listeners. Folks can find us at artifacts.com. That's A-R-T-I-F-C-T-S.com or in the app store. Great. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.